what actually do we mean by coloration? What is this analogy with the visual field? Obviously, people tend to think that we are a visual creature as opposed to an auditory one, and so it's very easy to draw parallel, or easier to understand things by drawing parallels with um, visual analogies. When we talk about coloration in sound, what we're talking about is the relative uh, loudness of different frequencies, and the visual analogy is the relative different, uh, different levels of different colors. So a very colored loudspeaker is equivalent to putting a colored filter in front of your eyes. Or indeed, maybe another analogy might be painting a light bulb. Why is coloration such an issue? Why are we so sensitive to these variations in frequency response that I'm going to talk about? Well, I believe that really it goes back to uh, our evolution uh, as a living creature, as an animal in the wild. Because there are an awful lot of times when you can't really see the thing that you need to know, and sound will give you an awful lot of information about that item. And it might be the ripeness of a fruit, or the soundness of a piece of wood, but just by tapping it with your knuckle, you can immediately tell a whole lot of stuff about what's happening behind its skin. Or perhaps you're in a darkened cave, creeping your way around, and just being able to judge the size of the void and the proximity of the walls just by hearing the comb filtering of the reflections. Maybe it's the thing which gives a little clue about the furry creature with big teeth that's coming up behind you. All of these things are a life and death matter and having acute auditory sense might save your life. But more recently, of course, we've developed musical instruments, violin makers and the like have been honing their art and our ears have become more and more sensitive as a result of hearing the difference in quality between, between one piece of wood and another. The net result, of course, is therefore we're incredibly sensitive to those, uh, those qualities when they are a part of reproduced sound. And in the main, the biggest culprit of color, in terms of uh, coloration and frequency and time domain are the loudspeakers. So that's where most work can be done, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. My real start to my career in uh, the loudspeaker industry came when I joined the company belonging to this chap, John Bowers, the company being of course Bowers and Wilkins Loudspeakers. I actually joined as an electronic engineer, but my real interest was loudspeakers, but I didn't know how much I didn't know until I met this guy. Now he gave me the task of pursuing the development of a moving coil, electri a moving coil equivalent to electrostatics. Now, John had created this landmark product, the DM70, back in the early 70s. Basically, a closed box moving coil base unit, but with this electrostatic mid and high frequency unit mounted on top. Now, that electrostatic head did have a wonderful open quality, really was difficult to match. The uh, conjunction with a moving coil base unit is simply because actually shifting enough air with electrostatics was always a bit of a challenge and the, quad, the original quad, uh, now known as a quad 57, was whilst being a superlative loudspeaker in so many respects, simply not capable of reproducing the level of a large orchestra. This hybrid was in some ways a wonderful uh, best of both worlds solution. The truth was, even in conjunction with that base unit, it was limited in its maximum SPL. And so, going back one slide, that's why in the late 70s, John and his team developed the Lama 801. That was used in so many recording studios and became really quite ubiquitous. John was always bothered. There was something about the 801 which didn't quite match the, the mid-range quality, as he, he used to put it. So my job, I was charged with the task of trying to work out what it was about the 801 which didn't match the DM70, and indeed, uh, to see if the solution might be a question of the 
uh, the difference between a monopole and a dipole. The DM70 was a, a dipole, the 801 was a monopole. That is to say that the sound from the back of the diaphragm was constrained in a little box. And John had always suspected that maybe the big difference was the fact that the DM70 was this dipole. So as much sound comes out of the back as comes out of the front. So my first line of inquiry was to put Kevlar drivers on what was known as a Brownmill and Weber resistive baffle. That is to say, the original form, which isn't there, the original one was a, literally a rectangular baffle with fabric stretched across the frame and the drivers mounted in the middle. And the idea is that it behaves as more and more of a baffle as you go down and down in frequency. So it's, a, it's an expanding baffle, which of course is quite uh, an interesting approach. Now, as it happens, the rectangular frame was far from ideal for reasons that I will actually come to in a bit. And so I tried various other exotic uh, approaches. And the most successful was actually this flower petal arrangement. The cloth, of course, isn't there, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the flower petal. But uh, that was the, the rigid, uh, the shape of the rigid material underneath. But it was uh, then uh, cloaked in a thick woolen fabric. Once we dealt with the cabinet resonances by effectively eliminating them, it became quite clear that the next most obvious thing was the sound of the cone itself. Now, at that stage, Kevlar was still a wonderful new material, and BMW really truly believed that it was the non plus ultra of the loudspeaker world, and so it was a little bit difficult for them to stomach the fact that, well, maybe it was actually not as perfect as we thought. But bit by bit, as I looked into it, it became clear that that was the issue. Kevlar sounded like Kevlar, paper sounded like paper, plastic, as up there on the right, sounded decidedly like a plastic cup. So really at that point I started to look for a new type of driver, something which didn't have this sonic signature, which had, you know, was, was clearly the issue with these devices. As BMW at that time were just beginning to use metal domed tweeters, it seemed logical that the next thing to try was a larger metal dome. And as you can see in this early prototype here, we have a line of three 50 millimeter metal domes. And they really do behave pretty damn well, right up to the first break of frequency, which in that case, those original metal domes, was about 11 kilohertz. So that's a prototype of a loudspeaker, and this is a prototype of some of the loudspeakers, and eventually that became the prototype of another loudspeaker, which ended up with this loudspeaker, which you may all recognize. That Nautilus design is very free of coloration. There, there is no question. I'm very proud of what we achieved there. Let's go further into understanding what those sources of coloration are and why the Nautilus did actually manage to get over most of them. So, as I said before, coloration is caused by unevenness in the perceived frequency response, which could be, and usually is, caused by resonance, but can also be the, ref the result of uh, reflections and diffraction. There are, some people would actually use the word coloration to apply to nonlinear effects like distortion, uh, but I prefer to call them distortion. <coughs> so I keep them separate, and um, I'm not going to talk about nonlinear distortion today. I am just going to stick to resonance, reflection, and diffraction. Okay, resonance, so what's that about? Resonance, ping, drinking you know, lead crystal glass, bell, tube, any of those things. It's something we're very familiar with. And in each case, it's caused by a system where you have uh, two forms of stored energy, usually a spring and a mass. And the mass moves or bounces on the spring, and the energy is uh, exchanged between potential energy in the spring and kinetic energy in the mass. Resonance can have, uh, it has a frequency, it has a Q factor, which is the uh, purity of the resonance, and it's the length of time for which the thing will carry on ringing after the stimulus has been removed but also the strength of coupling. So you can have something with a strong resonance, but it's remote. Literally, you can have a wine glass in another part of the room, not very closely coupled with the loudspeaker, so you won't really you won't, uh, hear the, the glass resonating unless you actually put your ear right next to it. Or you can have the, op the opposite extreme, 
where it's the actual diaphragm itself which is doing the resonating, and then it's extremely audible. Again, I'll use that analogy, it's like having a coloured light bulb. There's very little you can do about uh, fixing uh, the effects of a resonance if it's actually coming from the diaphragm itself. So let's start with some measurements. And I'll start with the, uh, the point at which my investigations began, and that's the Kevlar code. Now, this is a very typical and quite well-recorded Kevlar code, not actually a BMW one, I have to admit. And you can see, this is the frequency response, and you can see that it has these irregularities, and that means that these frequencies will be subjectively louder than others. But most importantly, you can see the way they behave in the time domain. They carry on ringing, which means they have a, you know, we call it a high Q. It means they're much more noticeable. So, we have to improve, oh sorry, uh, what is cone breakup? I use this term, I bandy this term around, what actually do I mean? Well, um, if, that's, uh, if this is the cross-section of the cone and the voice coil is here, at low frequencies of course it moves together and as you gradually increase the frequency, the edge starts to get left behind and it eventually, at some point it will start to flap and that tends to uh, occur at one frequency and then it flaps a little bit further in, and that's a higher frequency, and as you go up the frequency spectrum, the flexure goes further and further in until really only the uh, part of the cone right next to the voice coil actually is moving with the coil. Everything else is just a sea of chaos. And uh, frankly, it's something which I think we can do without in a good loudspeaker. Okay, so what's a better loudspeaker? Well, I already mentioned metal, metal domes. A very easy uh, way of making a loudspeaker with a metal cone or dome is to stick a normal sized little voice coil somewhere near the apex of the cone. And indeed, it does work pretty well. This is, again, a highly regarded full range, little full range loudspeaker. <coughs> and you can see it also has these um, peaks and troughs in the response. But I can tell you that whilst these are structural modes, they are cone, or dome in this case, breakup. This one is caused by a different effect. That one is an acoustic effect. That's actually caused by the cavity at the front. Now, we all know that if you blow across a milk bottle, you'll get a note, a nice pure note. As you change the volume, the note gets <laughs> higher, or you open the mouth, um, the frequency gets higher, and indeed, my mouth is a cavity resonator, and as I go wow, 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 that's just a Helmholtz resonator filtering the sound of my vocal cords. So that's a really common resonator. But resonators don't always look as obvious as a milk bottle or an organ. Even something as shallow as an ashtray has an associated resonator because it has a little bit of an air volume and it has a bit of depth. This, is, oh, these curves uh, show uh, a series of shallow cavities and that they show the effect. If you, if you were to put sound in the back wall of that shallow cavity, they show the effect that that has on the acoustic response on the SR. So you can see that something where the diameter is about six times the depth has a lump of about three decibels. Well, that is pretty much what you have with a lot of conical loudspeakers. You've got a cavity and a surround, and those things conspire together, and you get this lump, usually for a typical cone loudspeaker, that's around two kilohertz. Actually, that particular sort of resonance can be EQ'd out, because it's right there at the source. It's low Q, so putting a notch in the frequency response, a notch in the crossover, will actually sort that one out, which is unusual, because most of the time, for instance, with the Kevlar, if you, put, if, you, if you were to equalize all those little peaks and troughs in the response to the Kevlar loudspeaker, it still would sound like a Kevlar loudspeaker because of the way that it squirts beams of sound in all sorts of different directions, and you can only really equalize it in one spot. So, an inverted metal dome, in so many ways, a good start, but that hollow is a disadvantage. So, as I said, at the time BMW were experimenting with, or actually we'd gone into production with 
26 millimeter tweaked domes, and they seem to work jolly well. So I thought, okay, let's expand the thing, let's make it a 50 millimeter dome, so it'll be good for mid-range. But, whereas a classic tweeter dome uses a solid disc of magnet, that traps a tiny little air volume behind it, and that gives you a very attenuated uh, low frequency response. You have to open up the space behind the dial. You can do it with a ringed magnet and a hole in the middle, or the way we later did it with Vivid. I'm afraid this is a, actually a Vivid image. At Vivid, we used an annular magnet with a hole down the middle, but the effect is the same. You have a hole at the back of the loudspeaker. Oh no, a chamber of air with a hole. What's going to happen? You get this beautifully pure, but very audible, resonant disc. The resonance is on the back, but the fact that it's on the back doesn't help. It really couples strongly with the diaphragm, and that's the effect. Now, you have got that nice low frequency response. This is the closed driver. You've got a nice low frequency response, but that is a stinker of a resonance, and that would stand out like a sore thumb. So we have to do something about that. My initial experiments were, of course, to put a chamber on the back, because that's what we tend to do when you with a loudspeaker. You've got to get rid of that radiation from the back. It's out of phase with the radiation from the front. You don't want it mixing with it. Uh, so you try to enclose it. All the chamber designs I tried initially suffered from their own eigentones, which is you know, the sound bouncing between the faces, the internal faces of the, of the chamber. The solution was to put a pipe on it. And whilst the original uh, design just used parallel sided pipes, as I think you saw in some earlier pictures. It turned out that an even better solution is to use an exponential pipe with graduated stuffing. Now, I have a little demonstration here. It's the only demonstration I'm going to give you today. Um, if I talk into this pipe, you can hear quite clearly the resonances as the energy bounces between the ends. And this is an exponentially damped tube, and it pretty much mocks up all the fundamental resonances. You can still hear the lateral resonances, they're much, much higher in frequency, but basically the internal resonances disappear. That thing could be attached to all sorts of systems uh, and uh, work equally well. It's a, a very tolerant technology, actually. You can stick up more or less anywhere and it'll absorb sound. Okay, so uh, how does it work? Pretty well, as it happens. You can see what we've got back, our low frequency performance, and it's absolutely free of resonant effects. So that's pretty cool. What about the diaphragm itself? Anything we can do there? Well, we were pretty chuffed with the 50 millimeter diaphragm as it stood, but 11 kilohertz, that's pretty audible. Was there anything we could do about it? Well, the first thing I did, uh, it's actually an old trick, is to put um, a stiff peripheral member on the outside, so uh, in this case a ring of carbon fibre, <coughs> uh, a system which actually is as old as the hills, uh, the dome in Florence Cathedral uh, used a series of wrought iron chains around the outside, and the Astrodome in Houston was it? Uh, used steel cables and again a uh, uh, parabolic or catenary shape, and that gives a huge improvement in the performance. So this is the plain metal dome, you can see that strong resonance there, uh, at about 12k in this particular case, and then you put the carbon fiber ring on and it shifts it right out of audibility. So it really is now, to all intents and purposes, a pretty perfect epistonic driver. It's not the only way of getting a pretty perfect epistonic driver. Ribbons are pretty damn good because the force is applied evenly across the whole thing. You've got uh, a ribbon carrying a current immersed in an even magnetic field, and the whole thing experiences uh, the same force right across it. There's a variation on the ribbon, which is uh, called an air motion transformer, equally good. Uh, everything's moved through 90 degrees, and the, uh, the, the ribbon looks pleated, looks like it's pleated, and the alternate pleats move in and out in opposite phase, and the air gets squished in and out between the, the pleats. But the effect is the same, it's driven evenly all, all over, and the response is really very, very good. ESL, I've already mentioned, the same sort of thing, uh, even drive right across the surface, so the whole thing moves um, in a very perfect way. Or, you know, I, I've often said, if I had my time again, if I'd met a different 
employer back in the 80s, I might well have become uh, a ribbon speaker designer or an emotion transformer uh, designer. ESL, mm, it's never going to go quite loud enough. Your ESL just really isn't rock and roll, whereas ribbons and AMTs, excellent system of reproducing sound. I could quite happily be one of those and still could. And then finally, I've got ionic or plasma. Now, what's wonderful about ionic or plasma loudspeakers is that the diaphragm now is the air itself. You've actually injected electric charge into the air so you can uh, move it around with an external field or in a classic plasma treater, you just vary the volume of this ball of plasma. And uh, it's a virtually massless diaphragm, which is excellent. The only thing is it's very small, and to get a decent amount of sound out of one of those things, is you really have to put a horn on it. I'll come to horns later. A good horn works perfectly well, but a bad horn mm, might be a compromise. So, back to Kevlar. I'm going to give you some uh, measurements now, show you some measurements and show you the effects of some uh, resonant and other uh, per perturbations in the vicinity of the diaphragm. I, I first of all, I'll show you Kevlar because I want you to get some idea of the magnitude of the imperfections that you might possibly have in the field. But this is the, the alloy dome for comparison. You can see how really it does behave in such a, such a lovely way. It just, at the end of the signal, it just drops. So we're going to look at the effects of nearby sources of resonance. Now, first of all, I exp expand the time window so you can resolve some more detail in that uh, falling section of the uh, waterfall plot. So, this is uh, just a, a short tube, a one inch tube, six, uh, six millimeter internal diameter, closed at one end, just held near one of these drivers, just in free space. I don't have a photograph of that, unfortunately. So you can see the way that, whilst in the steady state response, which this is, it's barely visible. That little wiggle, if I just whiz back to the Kevlar, if that little wiggle in this lot, you'd lose it, you really wouldn't see it. But the cumulative decay plot shows you that that little wiggle actually is a pretty long-lived and ultimately audible resonance. A 38 by 200 millimeter tube. Well, this is a 38 millimeter tube, so imagine a 200 millimeter long section. Again, barely noticeable in the steady state, strongly noticeable in the uh, decay part of the spectrum. But why is that relevant? Well. A 38 by 200 millimeter tube is a pretty typical dimension for a port tube. So port tubes are very often in the vicinity of a driver. So you do have to be careful where you put your port tube. And sometimes you may have to uh, you know, put it in the back or something like that, because it might, it might actually uh, solve the problem. There. Anyway, something to watch out for. What about holes in the baffle? Because now you put a square baffle around it. I'll come back to diffraction, but as soon as you put a square baffle around, it completely messes up the decay field, and you could again easily lose a little resonance caused by a hole like that, so you can, but you can just about make it out in the, in the further tail of the, of the decay part of the spectrum. Uh, other sorts of cavities, well, on the back of a driver, typically the magnet, which is a solid, you know, it might be a solid pole, inside the voice coil, behind the dust cap. As it stands, that tends to damp the motion at low frequencies because the air has to escape through the tiny little magnetic gap. So what many manufacturers do is drill a great big hole through the back. And of course, hey presto, what you've got but a resonator. There it is, nice, strong, long-lived resonance. In this particular example, what we do to sort it out is drill many, many holes in the voice coil form. And as you can see, that pretty much gets rid of it. If you look at some of those other effects, they're in both. They're due to uh, the environmental uh, measurements of the resonance. Uh, OK, that was one of our loudspeakers. Here's that off-the-shelf little uh, aluminum dome. Same sort of thing. It's got a hole in the back to allow the thing to breathe. Honking great resonance. Put my finger over the hole. Gone. So you do have to watch out for these things. They are, you know, they're there, they're real, and it's so easy to sort them out. Okay, reflection. We tend to think of reflection in terms of room acoustics, uh, 
it's very easy to hear. You clap your hands, you hear the reflection coming back. But as the boundary, the source of reflection, moves closer and closer to the loudspeaker, uh, you cease to be able to differentiate it as a separate segment. It becomes part of the, effectively part of the sound, uh, but as the phase moves in and out, it either reinforces or cancels the sound, and that becomes uh, audible. I can do this. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can hear the phasing effect, but it's a little bit subtle. I should really get a big piece of wood for that. This is a D50 again with a microphone, big piece of wood. Here you can see very clearly the reflected signal in phase, and here is the comb filtering effect. Okay, that's, that's going to happen any time you get a sound source near a reflective surface. And you know the most obvious and constant reflective surface is the floor. We all live with the floor reflection, the floor bounces. Uh, so much so that we don't really notice it as part of the loudspeaker's frequency response. In fact, it's a bit unnerving if you have a loudspeaker with, which doesn't have a floor bounce. In some recording studios, they dig a huge pit in the floor and fill it with foam to attenuate that thing. But a recording studio, of course, is not a real world, you know, so it's, it's actually a very analytical thing. Uh, but still, yeah, a very real effect. But what about other sources of reflection? Uh, like for instance, the <coughs> frame around the cabinet. Now that's a, it's an old style thing. And uh, here's an old style loudspeaker, and here's another fairly old style. I don't, I don't want to be rude about other people's designs. I'm just going to show you one or two little examples of things, just quickly as I whiz around the show. But sometimes people still do things which, frankly, you ought not to. Um, okay, so just two little pieces of wood either side. Uh, so it's really just part of a frame. And you can see that it puts five or six dB uh, wiggles in the frequency response. You can EQ them in this day and age of Trunoffs and other wonderful pieces of equipment. You can equalize that sort of thing. But the problem is that it has a different frequency response as you move around. So in fact, if you were to equalize that thing on axis, when you moved off axis, the problem would be even worse it's far better to stop the problem at source. So, uh, as you said, so, uh, I think I can, I can, I can name that one, because it's a JBL, it's a really old design, and they do it, so they can draw different. No, you know, it's plain not true. Okay, gaps between boxes. Oh my God, quick blink. Ooh, there's loads of them around. <laughs> um, gaps between separate sections. Look at that. It's really, you know, it's a strong effect. You would think, um, you would think people would avoid that. Anyway, I'll quickly whiz across this. <laughs> okay, diffraction. Um, diffraction is in fact very useful because if you didn't have diffraction, uh, you had a little pistonic driver, um, the sound would just come out as a pencil thin beam and you'd have to be right on axis. But actually, as long as the wavelength is significantly larger than the diaphragm, the sound spreads out nicely. And we can walk around the loudspeaker in here a good frequency response everywhere in the room. Okay, the sp sound spreads out from the driver, it follows the surface of the baffle, but what happens when you reach the edge of the baffle? Uh, forget my slides, actually. Hang on. Right, so there's the driver, those are the waves. It hits the baffle, and the sudden shock of going from being bounded on one side to being in free space it almost as much of a shock as hitting a solid wall, and you get a re-radiation from the corner. Now, of course, uh, that radiation is going to mix with the original, uh, original signal, and depending on the wavelength, the frequency, and the position, those waves are either going to add or subtract. Again, you can equalize these things, but if you equalize them in one spot, they'll be worse in another. So much better to avoid creating them in the first place. Oh, hang on. So, I said that over 60, I think it's 70 years now since uh, Olsen first published a book on loudspeakers. And he did some very simple experiments. He got a big round ball. But each one of these things was about this sort of size. He put a little loudspeaker, one inch loudspeaker in the side of all these objects, and showed how the effects of diffraction can really mess up the response of things with square edges, and that really the best shape is always going to be a baller. So here's a very similar little driver, it's uh, 
26 millimeter dome. It's not utterly smooth because, in fact, that little baffle, in effect, 50 millimeter baffle, means that A frequency is going to be a little bit louder than the rest. So it's not perfect, but at least it's free of sharp features, sharp wiggles. This is a little circular baffle. Circular baffle is the worst shape, of course, because everything is the same distance. So the diffraction coming from that edge is going to add or subtract the, to the sound on axis of very distinct frequencies. And you can see that. This again, it's comb filtering. It, the phases of the opposite to a reflection, but the effect is pretty simple. And the solution is so simple. You just put it in a curved surface and that problem pretty much goes away. There is a little bit of a wiggle there, but there is a little bit of a rim on the bowl. It's just, you know, the bowl's from a shop, it's not perfect. Um, and the other solution is to stick it on the side, the curved side of the cylinder. There are, again, there are some little wiggles there, you can see, because the end, I haven't taken any care whatsoever over the end, but they're so far away that you can get away with that. But I'm actually very proud of that response. So I, I just did this experiment um, before I uh, came to Munich, and uh, I'd never put one of these actual drives inside of just the simple tube, and it just works rather wonderfully well. Um, okay, so, well, I think I've shown you uh, the pitfalls that can uh, trip you up when sticking a little driver in the side of a cabinet. Uh, let's return to, uh, again, to where I started with dive holes. Uh, great, you drive the, and I'm talking here about things like electrostatics and magnet planers. You drive the whole surface equally, which is obviously uh, fairly wonderful, but there is still a chance of a bit of an issue because if you have this even source of sound which suddenly stops at the edge, it is also, that sudden stop is also a, a source of effectively of diffraction issues and you can, you will get comb filtering effects if you don't take some sort of action. So you can either graduate, gradually fade away the signal as you reach the edge or round the frame, actually or have, uh, yeah, have a, a, a big circular frame or have an absorbent frame. But, yeah, you, you can do something about it, but you do have to watch out for it. it, it dipole, the electrostatic or whatever, is fundamentally perfect, but stick it in a real environment and you do still have to take a few precautions. Horns. I really like horns, actually, I have to say. Uh, again, putting another hat on, I did work for a professional sound company. I thought, you know, they're, they're just great. They transform all the energy, well, actually 50% of the energy from the source, into real sound energy out there in the big wide world. And done properly, um, they are uh, free of resonance. I use this little expression, all the world is a horn, because, okay, a flat baffle effectively is a cone with 180 degrees included angle. I mean, uh, a straight conical horn like this, uh, we all understand as being a horn, but as you gradually open the sides out to flatness, it's still a horn. A driver in the wall is effectively horn loaded. Uh, and even, actually, a driver in free space. In effect, it's a four-pi um, four serradium horn. The problem with horns is just the transition between the horny bit and the free field outside. So, simple precautions, curve it uh, to the edge, and most of the horns you'll see today are beautifully curved at the edges, but I did spot one which was a bit, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Do we know it all? I mean, here I am telling you all about what I've learnt over the years, and I'm very proud of the speakers we've made, and you know, I've incorporated all of this where I can, all of this learning into it. I see something like that, and I think, ah, oh, that's pretty rough. I don't think that's going to sound very good. Can anyone guess what this not very good looking loud speaker is? <laughs> it's quite old. It's the good old. Quad electrostatic. Now, the irony is because it looks, the measurement looks pretty poor, but it's still regarded as one of the finest, uh, of the old school loudspeakers. So I think, you know, in response, no, we don't know everything about it, but we do try, and I will keep on trying. <laughs> okay, that's the end of that. Uh, any questions? Definitely. Um, what about what? For example, there are some companies who are saying that's the evil to put a board in a box some others are using board. Yeah, well, uh, it, 
it's a choice you make. Um, you, we put ports, people put ports in boxes because it gives you uh, about a half an octave of extension for a given size of driver and a given volume of box. Uh, it gives you about half an octave of extension in which the loudspeaker, the driver amplitude is actually less. And of course, uh, that means that as long as the port flow is uh, aerodynamically smooth, then actually it means you get less distortion across that band. The downside is, of course, that the low frequency response falls off more quickly. And as I said earlier, having tubes in the vicinity, there is a risk that they will cause resonances. So, you know, you have to be careful. If, if it's a base mid driver in an enclosure with a port, yeah, there's a risk. That base mid might excite resonances. Whether or not you like the sound of reflex uh, as opposed to closed close box, well, that's very much a matter of taste. It, I mean, ultimately, a closed box is possibly the more accurate, but the price is that effectively for the same amount of sound, it's going to have to be bigger, it's going to need more power. These are decisions, you know, you have to, you have to make. Now, there's no one right answer, you know. You make a choice. Um, are those aluminum? On, mm. So, if you had cost no object, yeah. It, would you like to say, well, metal domes, you love them? Is there a benefit in your thoughts of going to magnesium or even boron or something? Uh, magnesium, boron, titanium, aluminium—they're more or less in the same. Actually, boron's a bit higher, but it's a little bit tricky to make nice thin diagrams. Uh, magnesium, aluminium, titanium are all more or less in the same ballpark. Beryllium—that's out there. That's an that's an octave of improvement over aluminium, and diamond is another half octave still. Um, of course, diamond and beryllium have their own difficulties and costs. When we were developing these drivers, um, I was very, well, <laughs> let's be frank about this, we didn't have a huge amount of resources, and the tooling and cost of beryllium was a little bit daunting. The two suppliers of diamond had exclusivity deals with two manufacturers who I'm sure are showing now. So diamond was just simply not possible at that time. Beryllium was fraught. And it was at the time when I was applying a computer FEA optimization to the profile and this carbon fiber stiffener. And what I found was that by uh, appropriately shaping and reinforcing, uh, you could actually get a performance with aluminium, which is a, a, it's pretty respectable. We get a, 40, a 42 kilohertz breakup with this. The same thing in beryllium is probably about 60. You know, it's quite a long way beyond the audio band anyway. We can afford beryllium now. <laughs> Possibly, it's, it's actually possible to get a, a diamond film made by other people. But we sort of lost interest because we're very happy with our aluminium. <laughs> so it's one of those things, yeah, we might do beryllium at some point. I don't really see much point in. Uh, in going the diamond route. Uh, but beryllium maybe, yeah, that's quite practical. We, you, you can stamp beryllium with um, fairly conventional tools. So it's just, you know, we, we've played with uh, samples of beryllium and even a diamond. And the interesting thing is, we've done subjective tests. Um, in both cases, people chose the, uh, the aluminium. Um, I'm treading carefully because I can't give you a proper explanation. I, I, personally, I think it's because Okay, it wasn't just a beryllium or a diamond dome on our tweeter. It was actually somebody else's beryllium driver and somebody else's diamond. So you're changing quite a few things at the same time. It might not have been the diaphragm itself. It might be. For instance, we put lots of effort into getting a lot of magnetic flux into these drivers. So they're very efficient compared to most people. Uh, and uh, that means that the power compression is less, the damping is better. Mm. And then we've got this hole at the back as well, which the beryllium driver didn't. Um, sorry, does that answer your question? Okay. I mean, uh, these both have breakups that are well outside the audio band. This one is the <coughs> audio band, but then the crossover frequency is a lot further down. So actually, there's such a margin between the crossover frequency and its first breakup that I'm pretty happy that it's uh, it's safe. But yeah, we have looked at uh, not necessarily pure beryllium, uh, but beryllium aluminium alloys for the low mid. The basic is just no point, it's just miles away. The first breakups at 2 kilohertz, 
you're crossing over at 200 though, it's a margin of 10. <laughs> Okay, Eddie? Yeah? Um, you were talking about uh, pipes uh, that also can add, uh, can add, let's say, problems with resonance yeah. inside. Mm. But I think the matrix box is also, let's say, at the back of the speaker, also a lot of a pipes. General pipes. Yeah. I know you put it in because of the res resonance of the cabinet, mm. but... No, 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 ah, that's the structural resonance of the yeah. enclosure, yeah. 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 But did it also have effect on the refraction, for example, inside in the cabinet. In actually, uh, it was it was all right there because the relative sizes of the chambers and the holes meant that the um, the, the effects that you're quite reasonably talking about are safely out of band for the frequencies that the box was uh, recreating. But I know that later. Um, BMW did do some experiments with actually deliberately making the holes uh, of a certain size so that they could deliberately um, affect the propagation of the sound waves within the box, which is actually it's a very interesting thing. It, you know, it gives you uh, some very interesting. Uh, you, you can yeah, slow the slow the speed of sound down, yeah, yeah, in effect. But you can slow the speed down at some frequencies, but you can also get some horrible resonance at others. So. <laughs> Thank you. Can we, um, the design of these sound speakers, what can you tell us about the shape or why did you choose it like that? How was it developed? And well, it looks nice, it's one thing, but. Yeah, actually, you know, that's the thing is, I, I say often, when I'm actually giving a presentation on BBW loudspeakers, speakers, my first thing is, look, you know, people think that we just do this for the design. We don't. We, we're engineers. We start off from an engineering perspective and it ends up looking that way for, you know, mostly for a reason. This curly, spiral thing on the side, that's just pure frippery. But. Um, okay, well, you know what's going on behind these. They've all got these exponential tubes. I've already explained that they just absorb the rear sound. And then the smooth curve on the outside, uh, you saw that slide with the, the driver in the side of the cylinder. Yes. It, it just works very well. You, there's no single point where you can say, oh, that's the front and that's the side or whatever. It's just a smooth transition. So the sound wave never really sees a point yes. at which it goes from one thing to another. So, yeah, so there's no difference. What was the main fault, um, the cabinet? It's made from, just a moment. Ah. Oh, yes, please. Can I take oh. Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be, do you know what, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. We should have samples with our name on them. Yeah. Check out. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you one thing though. That's actually that's got a foam core, whereas in the real thing, we use balsa core for the shell. The foam core is used for the braces uh, that are put in laterally. But it's very hard. I cannot cut it. Like no, that and, and also that's not really what it's all about. It's the bending that's that's why yeah. you do it like that. Yeah. But that's not carbon fiber, right? Uh, no, no, it's just glass with black resin. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I'll, I'll answer your carbon fiber question. Some people say, why don't you use carbon fiber for your speaker? Um, what I've always said is that um, it, what the, the shell, the purpose of the shell is that it has to contain the sound from the bass unit. And it has to do so without having its own yeah. resonant mode. What determines the resonant the panel resonances? It's the, the combination of the stiffness and the mass per unit area. We can achieve any break, any resonant frequency that we can achieve with uh, carbon skins. We can achieve with glass, but it will weigh more because we'll have to put more glass on it. And what I always say is, look, if we were going to send these things into space then we'd make them from carbon. But as long as they sit on the ground in people's living rooms and glass does just not yeah. cheap. Um, from the weight of it, it doesn't weigh so from well, how come you have mass? Like how come how come it's so it's a heavy sticker. Yeah but a lot of that is the magnets in the base unit. <laughs> oh. Actually more than half of the weight is the crossover in the magnet. Mm. Oh, yeah. Quite a bottle, quite a lot more. <laughs> I was just wondering like when you mentioned the crossover um, 
having put so much mechanical engineering into the, the drive units, yeah. do they need much work in the crossover domain? Is it a quite simple first order or, or no, is well, a lot to them? We use fourth order overall. Uh, so the slopes are linked to fourth order. Uh, because the driver has its n natural second order bottom <coughs> performance and it has a sort of first order droop so the actual uh, the actual electrical filter response tends to be a second order uh, high pass and a third order low pass to get the bands but we we don't like super low orders because you end up putting a lot of power into drivers at frequencies where they're not really meant to be um, at low frequencies, if you have first order response, uh, genuinely first order response on a tweeter, the, uh, the output, the displacement would carry on increasing. So actually, base frequencies would get through to the tweeter at a significant level. So we prefer to have fourth order for those, definitely. And at the high frequencies, if you only have a, third, a first order, then, you know, earlier when I said that the breakup of this isn't a problem, well, if you only had first order, it would actually become audible. So. We tend to stick to fourth order, and besides which, actually, they so knit together really, really nicely. Yeah. And are, are all these parts of the circuit are they shunt, or are they are any of them in series with the drivers? Uh, both. 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 They are pretty classic ladder tools. Yeah. Yeah. And are those um, crossovers calculated, or is yeah. it really? <laughs> uh, well, actually, do you know what? They're not. Cal they're. Um, I use network analysis and optimization. I, I'm, I'm, I'm drifting slightly into a vivid audio presentation. I'm very aware of you guys. It's not, um, I do have a whole different show, <laughs> which I'll talk to you about optimizing. But basically, I, I, I joined BW, as I said, as an active loudspeaker engineer, because that's what I'd done for fun before, uh, while I was at university. Uh, and the very first thing I did there was design active filter. And I thought it's the only way of, and I see these people messing around with coils and capacitors, literally plugging them in, does it go up? No, no, well, take it up, put it up. You know, and just fiddling around by trial and error, watching the response, each time measuring the response and seeing, and, oh God, that looks like too much hard work. So I stuck to actives, and when we, we did the Nautilus, I did it absolutely with an active filter. When I joined my South African colleagues to start this, uh, escapade. Um, they said, "No way, no way can we do actives because you know it's already a silly shape. Nobody's going to buy it if it's active as well." So, um, <laughs> since then, and, and so, oh yeah, and so the point was like, "Oh God, passive filters." Oh, I'm not even sure I can do those. <laughs> anyway, um, one of my colleagues said, "Have you tried leap crossover analysis and optimization?" And my God. It's just completely transformed it. It's actually a pleasure to design a crossover with Leap. You measure the driver responses in the crazy anechoic conditions. You feed the numbers into Leap. You have to know a little bit about passive filters. I mean, it doesn't design it for you. You have to give it a, a basic uh, filter circuit. You give it a target response, and then you click on which components you feel might need changing, which might be all of them. And then you just go optimize, and it just goes around. It's, it's a dumb program. It just goes round and round, changing all the values. Does it make it better? Uh, yes. Does it make it better? Yes. Does it make oh no, worse. Stop, stop there. Go to another value. Up, 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 down, down, down. And it just goes round and round the loop, constantly changing. And the frequency response is there. You can see it working until gradually yeah. it, it will get as close as possible. It's brilliant. It's actually yeah, very. And the funny thing is that since then. I've sort of changed my mind about active. <laughs> I said, no, you don't really need active. Who benefits from active? Mm, amplified makers. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it happens that, of course, we, what we're doing today is fully active because the Trinoff box is it's just a dog. You know, it, uh, it does everything you, you could want. But what the Trinoff box does that no passive uh, minimum phase crossover could ever do, and that's equalize the phase response. And that, I mean, to me, that's magical. <laughs> response in room sounds too bright if it's flat so you always drop it by a bit, right? two or three db yeah. 
Sorry, no, across to across that spectrum. Yeah. Well, that's what people, I suppose, call hoist. <laughs> Bit cautious with that term, so we're not quite sure what it means. Okay. Oh, one more. So, um, with bass, you talk about in another world you love, really love horns, and I think the best bass I've heard here was an ancient RS, uh, RC yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And I built myself a giant open baffle bass thing that's massive, and nothing seems to, for, I don't know why it sounds so much more evolving. I know. Different. Or is it, what, what's going on there? Okay, look, I had a little experience. When we launched the original G1 in Seoul, Korea, uh, after the presentation, our distributor said, uh, are you interested in historical equipment? Well, of course I am. You've got to know where you've been before you know where you go. And uh, so I said, oh, I've got a good friend who is very interested in Western electric. And it was Mr. Chung who does silver tone. Anyway. So I was invited to come to his basement where he has just this incredible collection of lovely old equipment. But there in the end of the room are these two gigantic wooden W horns with field coil 18s and then on top of them a multi-cell is it 3x6 with a pair of 594 field sure. coil ones. It's a whole thing. And with, and with the original rack and everything. And he's there badgering me, saying, how do you think it's out? Eh? How do you think it's out? I'm all pretty polite about this. I'm saying, sure the character. Uh, I say, ah, you think it's out color? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most amazing and beautiful experience. It's like the sound just comes out. And I think, well, it might not work, but it's a lovely, lovely shade of warmth. Shade of color. <laughs> so, yeah, I knew I'd met my match there. Uh, so there, there is something magical. Well, like I say, we. We say we know what we're doing and we, we can measure all these effects and we do try, but then you know, see something like that which on paper looks pretty rough and it sounds just delicious. And similarly with um, that Western Electric system, I'm sure it must have measured pretty. Yeah. Uh, it would have had peaks and troughs all over the shop, but it was just lovely. So yeah, we keep trying. I've got a distinct, I'll go on one more. I've got a distinct feeling we really should allow Trin off to get back to their demonstration, but I'm quite happy to carry on. Yabbering for ages outside, sorry. I just had a very silly question. I was going to say it's old. Yeah. That's perfect. That's a point. Thank you, everyone. standing in the hallway because people were coming in looking for demos. And I was like, no, oh, we're doing a presentation. We'll be doing demos soon. You know, but we need to let Lawrence finish. And obviously, you were all asking oh, really yeah, interesting yeah. questions. Yeah. Hmm? Can we listen to the the reels? You want to start with that and then go back to stereo? Yeah. Just for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But then it's artificially up mixed. Right? Uh, yeah. Do you know where the other remote is? He also has a remote of the 